cyber security has become one of the most rigid industries in the last decade while simultaneously being the most challenged. With every aspect of corporate culture going online and embracing cloud computing, there is a plethora of critical data circulating through the internet, all worth billions of dollars to the right person. Increasing benefits require more complex attacks and one of these attacks is a brute force attack. A brute force or known as brute force cracking is the cyber attack equivalent of trying every key on your keyring and eventually finding the right one. Brute force attacks are simple and reliable. There is no prior knowledge needed about the victim to start an attack. Most of the systems falling prey to brute force attacks are actually well secured. Attackers let a computer do the work, that is trying different combinations of usernames and passwords until they find the one that works. Due to this repeated trial and error format, the strength of password matters a great deal. Although with enough time and resources, brute force will break a system since they run multiple combinations until they find the right passcode. Hey everyone, this is Bhavab from Simply Learn and welcome to this video on what is a brute force attack. Let's take a look at the topics we need to cover today. We start by learning about what a brute force attack is and its reliability as a hacking technique. Next, we take a look at a step-by-step -step approach to how the hackers can take control of a system using brute force techniques. Moving on, we learn about the harmful effects of getting our personal devices brute forced or compromised and how it can affect not only our devices but our friends and family as well. We also understand a few steps that we can enforce to make a better security system against brute force attacks specifically. And finally, we have a demonstration that explains how the brute force mechanism works in a real world situation. But before we begin, make sure you're subscribed to our Simply Learn channel and click the bell icon to never miss an update from us. Let's begin with learning about brute force attacks in detail. A brute force attack, also known as an exhaustive search, is a cryptographic hack that relies on guessing possible combinations of targeted password until the current password is discovered. It can be used to break into online accounts, encrypted documents or even network peripheral devices. The longer the password, the more combinations that will need to be tested. A brute force attack can be time consuming and difficult to perform if methods such as data obfuscation are used and at times downright impossible. However, if the password is weak, it could merely take seconds with hardly any effort. Dictionary attacks are an alternative to brute force attacks where the attacker already has a list of usernames and passwords that need to be tested against the target. It doesn't need to create any other combinations on its own. Dictionary attacks are much more reliable than brute force in a real world context, but the usefulness depends entirely on the strength of passwords being used by the general population. There is a three step process when it comes to brute forcing a system. Let's learn about each of them in detail. In step one, we have to settle on a tool that we are going to use for brute forcing. There are some popular names on the market like Hashcat, Hydra, and John the Ripper. While each of them has its own strength and weaknesses, each of them perform well with the right configuration. All of these tools come pre-installed with certain Linux distributions that cater to penetration testers and cybersecurity analysts like Kali Linux and Parrot Security. After deciding what tool to use, we can start generating combinations of alphanumeric variables whose only limitation is the number of characters. For example, while using Hydra, a single six-digit password will create 900,000 passwords with only digits involved. Add alphabets and symbols to that sample space and that number grows exponentially. The popular tools allow customizing this process. Let's say the hacker is aware of the password being a specific 8-digit word containing only letters and symbols. This will substantially increase the chances of being able to guess the right password since we remove the time taken to generate the longer ones. We omit the need for including digits in such combinations. These small tweaks go a long way in organizing an efficient brute force attack since running all the combinations with no filters will dramatically reduce the odds of finding the right credentials in time. In the final step, we run these combinations against the file or service that is being broken. We can try and break into a specific encrypted document, a social media account or even devices at home that connect to the internet, let's say there is a Wi-Fi router. 
The generated passwords are then fed into the connection one after the other. It is a long and arduous process, but the work is left to the computer other than someone manually clicking and checking each of these passcodes. Any password that doesn't unlock the router is discarded and the brute force tool simply moves on to the next one. This keeps going on until we find the right combination which unlocks the router. Sometimes reaching the success stage takes days and weeks, which makes it cumbersome for people with low computing power at their disposal. However, the ability to crack any system in the world purely due to bad password habits is very appealing and the general public tends to stick with simple and easy to use passwords. Now that we have a fair idea about how brute force works, let's see if we can answer this question. We learned about how complex passwords are tougher to crack by brute force. Among the ones listed on the screens, which one do you believe will take the longest to be broken when using brute force tools? Leave your answers in the comment section and we will get back to you with the correct option next week. Let's move on to the harmful effects of getting a system compromised due to brute force attacks. A hacked laptop or mobile can have social media accounts logged in, giving the hackers free access to the victim's connections. It has been reported on multiple occasions where compromised Facebook accounts are sending malicious links and attachments to people on their friends list. One of the significant reasons for hacking, malware infusion is best done when spread from multiple devices, similar to distributing spam. This reduces the chance of circling back the source to a single device which belongs to the hacker. Once brute forced, a system can spread malware via email attachments, sharing links, file upload via FTP, etc. Personal information such as credit card data, usage habits, private images and videos are all stored in our systems, be it in plain format or root folders. A compromised laptop means easy access to these information that can be further used to impersonate the victim regarding bank verification, among other things. Once a system is hacked, it can also be used as a mail server that distributes spam across lists of victims. Since the hacked machines all have different IP addresses and MAC addresses, it becomes challenging to trace the spam back to the original hacker. With so many harmful implications arising from a boot force attack, it's imperative that the general public must be protected against such. Let's learn about some of the ways we can prevent ourselves from becoming a victim of brute force attacks. Using passwords consisting of alphabets, letters and numbers have a much higher chance of withstanding brute force attacks thanks to the sheer number of combinations they can produce. The longer the password, the less likely it is that a hacker will devote the time and resources to brute force them. Having alphanumeric passwords also allows the user to keep different passwords for different websites. This is to ensure that if a single account or a password is compromised due to a breach or a hack, the rest of the accounts are isolated from the incident. Two-factor authentication involves receiving a one-time password on a trusted device before a new login is allowed. This OTB can be obtained either via email, SMS or specific 2FA applications like Authy and Aegis. Email and SMS based OTPs are considered relatively less secure nowadays due to the ease with which SIM cards can be duplicated and mailboxes can be hacked. Applications that are specifically made for 2FA cores are much more reliable and secure. CAPTCHAs are used to stop bots from running through web pages precisely to prevent brute forcing through their website. Since brute force tools are automated, forcing the hacker to solve CAPTCHA for every iteration of a password manually is very challenging. The CAPTCHA system can filter out these automated bots that keep refreshing the page with different credentials thereby reducing the chances of brute force considerably. A definite rule that locks the account being hacked for 30 minutes after a specific number of attempts is a good way to prevent brute force attempts. Many websites lock account for 30 minutes after 3 failed password attempts to secure the account against any such attack. On an additional note, some websites also send an email instructing the user that there have been 3 insecure attempts to log into the website. Let's look at a demonstration of how brute force attacks work in a real world situation. The world has gone wireless. With Wi-Fi taking the reins in every household, it's natural that the security will always be up for debate. 
To further test the security index and understand brute force attacks, we will attempt to break into the password of a Wi-Fi router. For that to happen, we first need to capture a handshake file, which is a connection file from the Wi-Fi router to a connecting device like a mobile or a laptop. The operating system used for this process is Parrot Security, a Linux distribution that is catered to penetration testers. All the tools being used in this demo can easily be found pre-installed in this operating system. If getting your learning started is half the battle, what if you could do that for free? Visit SkillUp by Simply Learn. Click on the link in the description to know more. To start our demo, we're going to use a tool called AirGeddon, which is made to hack into wireless networks specifically. At this point, it's going to check for all the necessary scripts that are installed in the system. To crack into a Wi-Fi and to capture the handshake file, we're going to need an external network card. The significance of the external network card is a managed mode and a monitor mode. For now, the WLX1 named card is my external network adapter, which I'm going to select. To be able to capture data over the air, we're going to need to put it in monitor mode. As you can see above, it's written it is in managed mode right now. So we're going to select option 2, which is to put the interface in monitor mode. And its name is now WLAN0 monitor. The monitor mode is necessary to capture data over the air. That is the necessary reason why we need an external card since a lot of inbuilt cards that come with the laptops and the systems, they cannot have a monitor mode installed. Once we select the mode, we can go into the fifth, which is the handshake tools menu. In the first step, we have to explore for targets and it is written that monitor mode is necessary to select a target. So let's explore for targets and press enter. We have to let this run for about 60 seconds to get a fair idea about the networks that are currently working in this locality. For example, this ESS ID is supposed to be the Wi-Fi name that we see when connecting to a network. Geo24, Recover Me, these are all the names that we see on our mobile when trying to search for the Wi-Fi's. This BSS ID is supposed to be an identifier, somewhat like a MAC address that identifies this network from other devices. The channels features on one or two, or there are some many channels that the networks can focus on. This here is supposed to be a client that is connected to one such network. For example, the station that you can see, 5626, this is supposed to be the MAC address of the device that is connected to a router. This BSS ID is supposed to be which Wi-Fi it is connected to. For example, 5895D8 is this one, which is the Geo24 router. So we already know which router has a device connected to it and we can use our attack to capture this handshake. Now that we, it has already run for one minute, now that we press Ctrl C, we will be asked to select a target. See it has already selected the number 5 which is the Geo24 router as the one with clients. So it is easy to run an attack on and it is easy to capture a handshake for. We select network 5 and we run a capture handshake. It says we have a valid WPA, WPA2 network target selected and that the script can continue. Now, to capture the handshake, we have a couple of attacks, a DAuth or a DAuth air replay attack. What this attack does is kick the clients out of the network. In return, when they try to reconnect to the Wi-Fi, as they are configured that way, that when a client is disconnected, it tries to reconnect it immediately. It tries to capture a handshake file which in turn contains the security key, which is necessary to initiate the handshake. For our demo, let's go with the second option, that is the DAuth air replay attack. Select a timeout value, let's say we give it 60 seconds, and we start the script. We can see it capturing data from the Geo24 network, and here we go. We have the WPA handshake file. Once the handshake file is captured, can actually close this and here we go, congratulations. 
In order to capturing a handshake, it has verified that a PMK ID from the target network has successfully been captured. This is the file that is already stored, the .cap file. For the path, we can let's say we can keep it in a desktop. Okay, we give the path, and the handshake file is generated. We can already see a target over here, same Geo24 router with the BSS ID. Now, if we return to its main menu, we already have the handshake file captured with us. Now, our job is to brute force into that handshake capture file. The capture file is often encrypted with the security key of the Wi-Fi network. If we know how to decrypt it, we will automatically get the security key. So let's go to the offline WPA WPA2 decrypt menu. Since we'll be cracking personal networks, we can go with option one. Now to run the brute force tool, we have two options. Either we can go with the air crack or we can go with the hash cat. Let's go with air crack plus crunch, which is a brute force attack against a handshake file. We can go with option two. It can already detect the capture file that we have generated. So we select yes. The BSS ID is the one which denotes the Geo24 router. So we're going to select yes as well. The minimum length of the key, for example, it has already checked that the minimum length of a Wi-Fi security key, which is a WPA to PSK key, will always be more than eight digits and below 64 digits. So we have to select something in between this range. So if we already know, let's say that the password is at least 10 digits, we can go with the minimum length as 10. And as a rough guess, let's say we put the maximum length as 20. The character set that we're going to use for checking the password will affect the time taken to brute force. For example, if we already know that or we have seen a user use the password while connecting to the router as something that has only numbers and symbols, then we can choose accordingly. Let's say if we go with only uppercase characters and numeric characters, go with option seven and it's going to start decrypting. So how aircrack is working right here, you can see this passphrase over here. The first five or six digits are A. It starts working its way from the end, from the last character. It keeps trying every single combination. You can see the last, the fourth character from the right side, the D, it will eventually turn to E because it keeps checking up every single character from the end. This will keep going on until all the single characters are tested and every single combination is tried out. Since the handshake file is encrypted using the security key, that is the WPA2 key of the router, whichever passphrase is able to decrypt the handshake key completely will be the key of the Wi-Fi router. This is the way we can brute force into Wi-Fi routers anywhere in the world. Thank you so much for watching our video. If you have any questions or queries regarding the topic, please leave your questions in the comment section and we will get back to you as soon as possible. Subscribe to our channel and make sure that the bell icon is clicked so that you never miss an update from us. Hi there, if you like this video, subscribe to the Simply Learn YouTube channel and click here to watch similar videos. To nerd up and get certified, click here.